Why do sad, negative feelings stay with me so much longer than the happy and positive ones? When I feel happy and blissful, I wish I could just bottle it. But somehow it seems very short-lived, and it is taken over by feelings of sadness, frustration, and anger. This is very common, and the reason for that is if you look at the cause of the feelings of happiness and bliss and the cause of the frustration and sadness. So our causes, in most cases, of our happiness and bliss is something that we get from outside. We were studying for an exam. We take the exam. We do really well. We're very happy. We were looking forward to a party. We go to the party. We really enjoy it. We're very happy. We have something nice to eat that we like, whether it's a cookie, whether it's pizza, whether it's mom's special food, whatever it is. We think about it. We love it. Finally, we get it. We enjoy. But all of these things don't last very long. A meal is over in 20 minutes, half an hour if we really linger, a party's a couple of hours. The exuberance we feel after doing well on an exam or doing well at something at work is inevitably short-lived because right after that, we have to start learning things for our next exam. They don't let you ride very long on one exam in school. One exam is over and then it's okay. Now learn the stuff for the next exam. Same at work. You do something really well. You do a project that was great. You feel wonderful. But then it's, it's business as usual. Back to the work. And so the, the things that give us that happiness and that give us that bliss, because we're getting it from things outside, it's not going to last. And then why does the frustration and sadness last so long? Well, because again, what we've told ourselves is, until and unless I get that which makes me happy, I'm not happy. So until I have another one of mom's great meals or until I get another of those pizzas or another of those cookies or until I'm sure that I'm going to do well on my next exam as well, we're anxious, maybe we're frustrated, we're worried. The other thing that happens is when happiness comes, as the questioner said, I wish I could bottle it. Now that's something we all feel. You have this beautiful moment, maybe a deep moment even, maybe not even just a superficial, you know, food or exam or party moment, but a deep moment of bliss. And the first thing that comes to our mind is, oh my God, how can I hold on to this? Oh my God, this is going to go away. We fall in love and the first thing we think is, oh my God, what if something happens to them? We have a child great joy, but that joy is tempered so much by fear. Oh my God, what if they get run over by a car? They're going in the street. What if they eat this? What if they get sick? Why are they crying? So even bliss and joy that's deeper, it doesn't last because what it does is in our efforts to hold on to it, and our efforts to make sure it doesn't go anywhere, we've brought in fear into the joy. And for those of us with overactive intellects and imaginations, you can actually get yourself in your mind already into the place where the loved one is sick or dead, where the child has been run over by the car, where something horrible has happened. And so, here you are in this moment in which everything is perfect, everything is there, but we're not even able to enjoy the real 
joy of the moment for very long because our anxiety kicks in, our fear kicks in, our longing to hold on to it kicks in. And the truth is, nothing lasts forever. Everything has a cycle. You know, we talk so frequently about the waves of the ocean. And they go up and they go down. And if my happiness is connected to the going up wave on the ocean, then the minute that that wave goes down, I'm going to no longer be happy. And this is where the key is not how can I bottle my happiness. The key is not how can I make sure this doesn't end. Because of course, in thinking that, I've already ended it. In trying to figure out how to bottle it up, in trying to figure out how to make sure that nothing happens to it, I've brought in the fear. I've brought in that sense of dissatisfaction. See, I have it now but it's not enough. I need to have it tomorrow also. I need to have it next year also. And what that does is it brings an element of lack into a moment that is otherwise very full and a moment that is otherwise very, very blissful. What I've done is I've shifted my perspective from abundance to lack. And that's what removes the joy. The more I realize that this moment is not enough, I've got to make sure that it's still with me tomorrow, that it's still with me next week, that it's still with me next month, that it's still with me next year. Well, I've shifted the entire perspective from a feeling of, oh, everything is perfect, to a feeling of, it's not yet enough. Maybe if I have it also tomorrow, also next week, also next month, also next year, also forever, maybe if this, this thing never leaves me, maybe then it'll be enough. And what that reminds us on a very deep level is it's never enough. There's always lack. And that, of course, brings us into depression and frustration and sadness. And so in the moments of joy, live them fully. And I'll tell you a a hint, a secret. A secret from science. Spirituality has been telling us for thousands of years, live in the moment, live in the moment, live in the moment, be present, be present, be present, be here now. But here's what neurology has taught that I find really interesting. If you actually want to hold on to a feeling, if the joy in this moment is so powerful that you want to make sure it's with you next week or next month, Actually, you have a way to do it. And the way to do it is to be so present here in this moment that it actually creates a a pattern in the brain. This is why everybody knows where they were when something traumatic happened. So we all know where we were on 9-11. My mom's generation could tell you where they were when John F. Kennedy was shot. Whatever the tragic shocks that have taken place in our generation, everybody knows exactly where they were standing, exactly what, you know, what, what the world looked like around them on what was otherwise a very ordinary day. In your life, if you've had any sort of traumatic experience, something bad that's happened. Inevitably, you can remember every aspect of that day. If you had an accident, if a loved one has passed away, we remember the details like they were in front of us, even if it happened years ago. 
We remember uh, in the morning we woke up and we had oatmeal for breakfast and then he asked for a second cup of coffee and I walked into the kitchen and I was still in my bathrobe and I was making the second cup of coffee and just I put one sugar cube into it and I turned around and saw that he had had a heart attack, right? We remember that level of detail. Why? Because on a neurological level, When something very, very meaningful, very, very profound happens, everything surrounding it gets cemented into our consciousness. Cemented in. It's there forever. And so if you're in the midst of a moment of peace and joy and bliss, make sure that your mind is so present there. Make sure that you're fully 200% there and your mind isn't wandering someplace else. Cement that moment in your mind. What does it smell like? What does it look like? What does it sound like? So you're in a moment of joy. Well, all right, what can you hear? What can you smell? What do you see around you? Use your senses and literally cement that moment in. And it's actually neurologically the very best way to keep it with you. But on the emotional level, the minute that we recognize that the only joy that actually lasts is the joy that comes from within not the joy that comes from the food or that comes from the party or that comes from anything else. The minute we recognize that is the source of joy, then we start focusing on that. Then rather than trying to bottle up the rest, we focus on finding a source that's, that's endless. And that's always there.